for the entire chapter three, we've talked about, we've kind of danced around a single rule. A column must be bound to a single data type. Okay. You could have your column be money or int, but cannot be both. Well, let's move away from that model for this one video. I'm going to talk to you about the SQL variant data type. So SQL variant data type is uh, let me say, allows you to store any type. Okay. So, for example, and I'll show you a usage here in just a second, but I'll use a, a declare and we'll create a variable. Let's just create a variable x and we'll call that, we'll make that SQL variant. It's SQL underscore variant. And we will assign it to be the value 258. Okay? Okay, now when we look at this back, it returns it. Now, the next time, though, I could say uh, set at x equal Scott, select at x. Okay? And now it's changed. Now, the variant is changing types. We can actually see this. There is a function called SQL variant property. You see it show up right here. And if you load it up, so go to your books online, double click on it, hit F1, you can actually see that it, you pass in what the variable name or the column name is that you're working with, and then what property you want to view about it. Okay? You want to view the base type property. This tells you what the data type is that it is using. You could see a precision, see how large it is, see the scale, see the total bytes required to hold it. So SQL variant property, we pass in at x, and I tell it I would like to see the base type, please. Okay. And I'll just do the exact same query over again down here. You can see that simply by assigning it the value, it changes the base type of the variable. It is a, it's kind of like the old Visual Basic var. I mean, you're just declaring an anonymous variable. You don't have to declare the type. Okay, so how can you actually use this in SQL? Well, yes, it can be a variable. It could be a parameter to a function or a stored procedure. But here's where I use these, or I see people using them successfully. Okay? There's a concept, a, a modeling technique called EAV, okay? Entity Attribute Value Modeling. And this is a way to, or it's, a, it's just a different way of modeling a table design. We talked earlier in one of the videos, I can't remember it, um, at some point, we wanted to have, I talked about a technique, a config type table that only allows a single row. We talked about that, and we're going to see more about this when we get into triggers and other techniques here. But one such pattern design, uh, and the reason we want a single row, let me just say here, is that there can only be one value for a given attribute slash column. I know, that make a sense. Let me just show you here. Create table dbo.appconfig. Let's just call it that. Okay. And in this table, we're going to specify all of the property values that we want our app to run under. So we would have something like, um, I don't know, a name of web server. And that's going to need to be, they can be Unicode, so it can be a maximum of, I think, 128 characters. Okay. So then the name of the web server uh, would be, you know, and then we'd have like login name and var car 128. And this would be encrypted, so maybe we need to make it a little bit larger. Uh, login password. I'm just making up stuff to put in here to show you. Um, path to log files. In var car 256, not null, default 
uh, C colon app logs. Just showing you a couple of things. And then we would populate this with a single row. And so this row would have the name of the web server, the login name, the login password. When the application launches, it would use this table to figure out how to log into a remote web service or where to store the log file. Okay? And we only want one row because we only want one path to the log file. Now, if you don't get it, I, I just stick with me here. Okay, so this would be a traditional relational database design. You have a column for each attribute and the value in the column. An EAV design would look something like this. Create table app config and you would have something like um, attribute which would be in var car 256 not null primary key um, and then value sql variant null so I, let me change these because we're getting things. So app table relational, app config relational, app config EAV. Okay. Notice that we have an attribute value. We have an entity that's going to store an attribute value, value pair. This is also called a key value pair, if you're familiar with that uh, parlance as well. Okay. And what we would do, I'll, I'll show you the insert. So insert dbo.appconfig relational name of web server, login, login password, and these obviously would be encrypted values, right? Uh, you'd say you know, values, that's your encrypted value, and, and you know, do some MD5, looking stuff, whatever. Um, That would be kind of like your basic insert there. We can only have a single row. Down here, though, for an EAV column, though, here's what you would do. You would say insert app config EAV okay, attribute value. And now your values, okay, you're going to say name of web server. Okay, and then you'd put in your value. And then you'd put in the next attribute, which is login name. And then you'd put in the, the actual value. You see what I'm doing, right? We're going to make a login password. And then we would put in the actual value. Now, the argument for doing this is that to change an application's configuration does not require adding a new column and changing all of your views and stored procedures. It only means you have to add a new row to the EAV table. Okay? So we have path to log file and then C colon app logs. And to select a given attribute, you would just say select value from app config where attribute equals name of web server. Okay. Whereas up here, we would have to say select name of web server from app config relational. So it shows you two different ways to do the same thing. Okay. Remember, adding a new configuration value here means we have to change the definition of this table. We have to go add a new column. Adding a new configuration down here simply means we just insert a new row. Okay. The SQL variant works here because in some cases you're going to have um, numbers. Um, like here's an attribute called number of simultaneous threads. Simultaneous threads. 
and we would say uh, 8. Okay? So that's going to be an integer. These are going to be strings, right? Down here, though, we're going to have um, date of next license check. And then we would put in something, you know, a date format here. So uh, get date plus 30. So we're going to check for 30 days in the future. So then that's going to become a date time value. That's brilliant, right? You love it. It's awesome. Lots of folks agree with that sentiment. I'm not a big fan of it. The reason is, let's say that you want date of le next license check to always be a date. How are you going to enforce that now? You've defined that the column value was a variant. How do you enforce that the, date, the attribute value for date of next license check is a date time value? We're going to have to talk about triggers later, but you would have to invoke a trigger upon insert that says if SQL variant property of the date of next license check, okay, of that actual column, really actually it would be the uh, value column, okay, is not of the base type not equal date time, then we'd have to reject the row. The problem with EAV is type checking. You basically have to write your own type system. You have to do all the type checking. If you want path to log file to be guaranteed to be a string, you have to perform type checking at the database level. So they're just two different alternatives. I opt for this one most of the time, but I do have a couple of situations where I think the EAV approach works better. Um, this requires a lot more coding as well. When we get into dynamic SQL, we might revisit some of this to see some of the challenges. But I just wanted to give you an idea about the SQL variant type and when a an actual real-world use of how you would work with it.